you know, we're going to be taking some dynasty frequently asked questions. So these are things that we get asked a lot by people. Um, if you want access to us to ask whatever you want, just about 24 hours a day, patreon.com forward slash dynasty rewind. I was just talking to my man, Chris earlier, talking in through some trade scenarios. We could be doing the same for you again, patreon.com forward slash dynasty rewind. You now get a 10% discount when you sign up for a year. So reaching into our grab bag. So Nate, we're going to start with you. How do you manage a taxi squad and determine which players to stash for the future? Yeah. So when you look at your taxi squad, the strategy of your taxi squad is going to be based on the timeline of your team. All right. If you're a contending team, then you want to value production on your bench. You don't want to put production on the taxi squad. So if you're a competing team, I don't like to put any running backs on the taxi squad. If I'm drafting a running back or picking up a running back off of waivers, I'm likely hoping for production year one in some fashion, even if it's just, you know, a spot start here, a spot start there. Or, you know, an injury gives them a player a role. With the running backs, we're looking for production. They're not doing us any good on the taxi squad where we have to take them off and then we have an empty taxi squad. Nothing, nothing makes me more angry than an empty taxi squad slot. That is a valuable slot. I do not want to waste it. I want to keep that player in there all season if I can. Um, I want them to force me to take them out, the taxi squad, basically. So running backs, I don't like to keep on there because I'm probably going to want to be using them the rookie year. Wide receivers, tight ends, great for the taxi squad. Um, those guys, oftentimes the you know players that are undrafted, day three picks, those players take a year or two to come into the woodwork and start scoring points, so it's okay to stash them for a year or two in the taxi squad. Quarterbacks can also be pretty good stash depending on their situation, if they're a backup or maybe if they're a quarterback that could be playing year one. That's a player I would like to keep on the bench if possible. But I'd I want to fill up all those taxi squad spots. I want to use them all. So we're going to use them no matter what players we have. Um, but if you're a rebuilding team, it can be smart to use the taxi squad to your advantage and have some production on your taxi squad. Now, you, you if you play by potential points, you know, you, you stash those first round pick on the taxi squad. I think that's fair game. I think that's fair game, guys. Some people are going to disagree with me. But, hey, if I'm drafting Bijan this year and my team has no one except for Bijan, you don't stand on my taxi squad, man. Okay. And I do agree. If you want to tank and you know, all you have is, is Bijan, I'm fine with keeping him on your taxi. I don't have a problem with that. Zach, do you have a problem with that? You probably have a problem with that. You have a problem. Heck with yeah, that, man. Of course. There of course is. I have a problem with that. Like, what is that? If you want to suck, suck. Don't, yeah, don't, exactly don't, don't, don't fake suck. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to run your team the way you want, do it. But I have a problem with that. <laughs> that ain't doing it. Ladies and gentlemen, is working with Zach Dworth. That you <laughs> That's ridiculous, man. How do you balance immediate success with long-term sustainability when constructing a dynasty roster? Yeah, this is a good question. Uh, for me, it's it's really got to be a good blend of youth and veteran presence in a roster. We, we do a lot of audits here, and we see these rosters uh, a lot of times that are just youth. And I think it's such a big mistake because I think at some point you're leaving points on the board and I get the ideology there, right? Oh, I want to have this team for the next five years, but you know, look, I want to win now. I want to win next year. I want to win this year. And you have to have veteran proven talent to do that. It's extremely rare to have just sophomore and rookie players and win a league. Like I've never really heard of that. That's kind of insane. So you have to have veteran presence on your roster. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that I do really is just to keep a solid pipeline of youth coming onto my teams. I very rarely trade my own first round pick and that gives me the flexibility to tank and that gives me the flexibility to, to compete as well. So it's a very rare situation where I'm trading my own first round pick. So I at least have that pipeline of youth. Um, it really, for me, this question depends on the start size of the league. You know, is it start eight? Is it start 10? Because at that point, if it start 10 and start 11, we need a deep bench. We need a deep roster. And that's what I'm going to depend on some veterans. You know, I talked a few videos about Marvin Jones Jr. Like nobody's really buying Marvin Jones Jr. But if I can spend a fourth round pick on a start 10 uh, team league and pick up a guy who might score, you know, might be a wide receiver three, might be a wide receiver four in Detroit with Jameson Williams suspended. Why Is not? So, I, uh, don't even get me started oh, yeah. on Isaiah Hodgins. So. Um, really, for me, the one kind of rule that I uh, apply, except for these specific situations, is I try to stay away from players that are 32 years old or older, just because you don't see a lot of fantasy production from those players, unless they're quarterbacks. Then I, you know, that rule just kind of goes out the window. But like, 
how many running backs are contributing, how many wide receivers are contributing, and how many tight ends. Don't 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 tell me Travis Kelsey. That's the exception to the rule. Uh, but yeah, I, I typically try to move that older talent off my roster when we get to that age, and I'm sure. A lot of people abide by that as well. So Zach, as good as he is at Dynasty and creating content, one thing he's not good at is following instructions. So we were supposed to select our questions and then put it out on the show sheet. He clearly did not scroll down to the bottom of the sheet and see how I selected. How do I balance immediate success with long-term sustainability when constructing a Dynasty roster? Uh, So I'll just add my two cents onto this one, if you don't mind, (laughs) Zach. Um, I think one common misconception when you assemble team rosters is youth equals rebuild and vets, aging vets equals win now. I just feel like people try to skew that a little bit. You want to try to find some younger players. Look, you might have to overpay for some of these guys that can be long-term solutions for your team. Think about guys like Justin Jefferson, Jamar Chase. They're still young. They're going to be contributors for a long time. Uh, That pay up front now will pay long-term dividends for your roster. For example, had you paid a 2022 first round pick from Miles Sanders when I told you to, that would have been a very, very good addition to your roster. Yet here we are. So your team should have a good balance of aging vets and younger players. I don't like to lean too far one way, to be honest with you. Make sure you're using all of your assets, be it players, draft picks, or fab, Zach. Everything has a value, even if it's just a throw in that gets trade done. And when trading, you always want to try to get something back, even if it's a late round pick or three fab dollars. So I, I, I do believe that my question was first on the show sheet before yours. So yes, but I filled the Sorry, show buddy. sheet out before you did. Oh, so really? Because when I went to the FAQs, that one wasn't highlighted. So I didn't highlight anything. I copied and pasted. Zach, you know what? I'm that, that seems like a personal but... problem, pal. <laughs> Okay, anyway, so, Mike, what are some common mistakes that you want to avoid for (laughs) Dynasty players? So, I personally don't want to be afraid to make moves if it helps your team. I think people get too complacent. They get too, you know, this is the next one. They fall too hard for their guys. You know, they, they just, they fall in love with the player, and they do not want to move off that player no matter what. Sometimes, selling off your best player makes your team better. Addition by subtraction. Sometimes you got to move the Jamar Chase. You have to move the Justin Jefferson. You have to move on from Josh Allen to get more players on your roster and make sure you diversify your fantasy football player portfolio. I was stuck in a rut where, again, I fell too hard for my guys. I had, let's say, 15 teams, and on 13 of those teams, I had the Michael P. Ryan. And how did that work out for me? A wasted draft pick. Should have known better, and it's something that I've learned from. And make sure you take the bias of your favorite team out of it when you build your roster. If you watch on YouTube, you see I'm a Philadelphia Eagles fan. I do not care who my favorite team is when I build my roster. Nate, back to you. What is the optimal number of players to roster at each position in a dynasty league? Say we're just in a super flex league. We have our quarterback, a super flex spot. We have two running backs, three wide receivers, a tight end, two flex spots, let's say. When I'm looking at my roster, I obviously want to have a competitive starting lineup. And, you know, you fill your slots there. So you have your two running backs, three wide receivers, et cetera. And ideally, on your bench, you'd like to have just about another lineup. And I'm not saying you have another competitive lineup on your bench. If you don't, that's okay. Most teams will not have a fully extra competitive lineup on their bench. Um, If you do, congratulations. You have a, a nice shot for the championship this year. But you want to have players you're comfortable with going into those positions in your starting lineup you feel comfortable starting those players. That means, you know, you have your two running backs, but your RB3 and your RB4, you need to feel comfortable putting to your lineup if needed because there's going to be bye weeks, there's going to be injuries. You're going to basically need a two deep at your lineup. So with quarterback, that's a little bit harder. You're not going to have four quarterbacks starting, you know, four starting quarterbacks on your roster most likely. Three is fine. You're not, you know, you're unlikely to have two quarterbacks out in the same week. And if you do, you got the super flex spot. You can throw someone else in there. So don't go crazy trying to get four quarterbacks. Three is all you really need in super flex leagues. In one quarterback, you really just need two and maybe a developmental one on your taxi squad. Running back, I'd like to have four that I'm comfortable with. Wide receiver, I'd like to have you know six, seven, you know, to start covering that flex spot depth as well. And uh, at tight end, I'd like to have two in a third developmental one, much like the quarterback position. You know, I want to have two guys I'm comfortable with, but I also want to have a third young player that has potential. They might never hit it, but at least I have a third guy I'm excited about that has potential that could, you know, get into that too deep or just give me depth that, you know, having three tight ends, three quarterbacks, whatever it is. Zach, 
How do you avoid overpaying for players in trade negotiations and maintain a balanced roster? Use your resources, right? Uh, listen, for whatever whatever everybody says about trade calculators, use them if you need them, okay? Because they're at least a, a, a source of reference to kind of give you a uh, an idea of where you stand and where that other player stands you're trying to acquire. Use rankings and use the community. We have a community, our Patreon community. There are things that I am unsure of all the time, and I'm asking in that community because I want to be reassured or told otherwise. So, you know, use those things. But another thing you have to be okay with here, Mike, is just walking away. Some dynasty managers have no intent on trading, and they only want to egregiously win a trade. We all know these kind of players, right? You yeah, have he's to right your- between us right now, Zach, in case you're wondering. <laughs> <laughs> it's oh, that guy no. you're not <laughs> wrong yeah i was gonna say nate's not even denying it either he's like wow. yeah you got me <laughs> it's true you uh you have to know your limits in in these kinds of things and be okay with saying thanks but no thanks it's just sometimes explaining why you can't do a certain thing in a trade or explain some logic in the trade like i know mike says oh you do you don't have a running back too but if you don't have a running back too that's a problem and it only gets more expensive as the se- as the season comes closer so there is logic in that statement okay but last but not least does the trade fit your parameters does it make you better now uh, if you're trying to go for it or if you're in a rebuild does it help you in a long term rebuild it has to fit those parameters uh more more importantly than anything i just said yeah i i want to add on real quick mike another thing and then i'm going to tell zach he's wrong if that's okay you're you're more than welcome to i will i would say don't rush a trade be patient. I actually just completed a trade today. Mm-hmm. I traded away uh, Tony Pollard and Donovan Peoples-Jones for Ramondre Stevenson in a one quarterback league. And that trade, it has been in negotiations for over a month. Mm-hmm. So over a month of back and forth of here's Tony Pollard, here's Ramondre Stevenson. Mm-hmm. Oh, maybe Saquon Barkley is involved. Oh, maybe Javante Williams involved. Maybe it started off, there was a Justin Jefferson in there at one point. It, it was a lot going on. But we didn't rush it. We are patient. I mean, we sent messages multiple times a week, going back and forth for over a month. Finally got there. You know, it's off season. Don't rush it. I, I had a situation similar to this also, where it was Juju for Khalil Herbert, and that trade got put on pause the moment that DeAndre Hopkins news came out. So same thing. Like, we were just having that conversation of, I want to do this trade. I got to see where D-Hop lands. If he lands in New England, I can't do it. But if he doesn't, smash he landed in Tennessee. We smashed the trade. I actually don't have a problem with people saying, oh, you don't have a running back, too. What I have a problem with is people dictating to me how I build my roster in May. Here's why. What you're saying is not wrong. Here's just another way to look at it. A lot of things happen between now and the week one kickoff. Training camp has not happened yet. Injuries have not really happened yet. You know, Isaiah Pacheco might be put on the pup. We saw uh, the guy that got drafted in New Orleans. I can't remember his name right now. Kendra Miller. Kendra Miller got put on the, what, the NI list or something like that? NFI, yeah. So there's a lot of things that can happen. And I think this is especially important to note if you are a rebuilding team. Okay, if you're a team, you're not in contention. Don't let people jam you on trades. Try to fill your roster out for you. Let it come naturally. You know, you want to pick up. I'm not going to just tell you to pick up the scraps, but just don't let anything get forced upon you. That doesn't make for good fantasy football play. So, Nate, time permitting, what are some signs that a trade offer is unfair or lopsided? Yeah, just a little quick hitter here. There are some very obvious signs that a a trade is far off. Number one, if it's a four for one, a five for one, a five for two, even a three for one sometimes is a little sketchy. If you are offered a trade for a good, like, one of your better players leaving your team and you're getting three, four, five players in that deal. It is not worth it to trade away one star player for three, four players that just don't really make an impact for your team. You need players to make a starting impact on your starting lineup. Your top players do that. Getting a bunch of bench depth for a good player in most situations is not going to be worth your time, not worth your energy, not making your team better. So as if you see something come in six for two, seven for three, something like that. Like I know they spent like 15 minutes trying to come up with that trade and they put it together, but it doesn't work. doesn't matter if it comes down the trade calculator. You, do, you just don't want that. Another thing is if two of the most valuable players in the trade are on your side, it is hard to put together a package where the, the package, once again, you know, it's probably going to be four or five players uh, for the two most valuable players in the trade on your side. If they're on the same side, 
It's not looking good for that side that's trading away that side. So those are two quick things. I always look forward to see if this trade's going to be, you know, far off. Um, always keep in mind your starting lineup. Always keep in mind your roster depth, your timeline. Those things really matter for your team. Make sure the trades that you're making fit your timeline, the strategy that your team is working towards. And Zach, how do you approach trading with teams that are also in a rebuilding phase? You have it down a little bit here. So, Zach, oh, how do you apologies. approach Apologies about that. You should. In in all seriousness, this is an interesting question. You're talking about two teams that are um, both in a rebuilding phase. First of all, if you're not trading that rebuilding team, you want to be the first one to be the rebuilding team, right? You don't want to be second to the race. Um, but that being said, I think what's really valuable here is don't waste people's time. Don't offer this rebuilding team a trade that doesn't make any sense for them because you're just wait like like Nate just talked about this where you're trying to pull off a trade that's seven for three and you're getting the two best. Like you're just wasting people's time. And for somebody like me, where my time is to me, it's very precious. You're, you're just wasting my time and you're calling me stupid and you're insulting me and without saying all those things to my face. But I, I, those are what the actions to me are, are telling me. So don't waste other people's time. Make sure that it's a trade that makes sense with them and, and have that conversation. If you need to like, Hey, I like, uh, I think Kendra Miller fits my fit better. Pacheco fits your fit better because I already have two Chiefs wide receivers, whatever it may be, to where the rebuilding trade helps both parties. It has to help both parties in this situation and make sense for them. You can't offer a rebuilding team Mike Evans. It makes no sense. I think one of the things, too, with that is how you approach people, like not saying, what do you want for this player? I, I'd like to come at people and say, would you be willing to move this player? So, you know, not what mm -hmm. do you want? And I don't know, make me an offer. People ask me, what do you want for Mike Evans? And I go, what are you offering? Well, what are you looking for? I wasn't looking for anything until you sent me a message saying you're interested. So bring something to the table. One approach I actually used recently was uh, there was a player that was selling off a lot of this team. Uh, and I was trying to buy some NFL players in the C2C league. And I was like, hey, I'm interested in these three players on your roster. I'd be willing to move these four or five players on my college team plus other players. Like, let me know what you think about that. And they came back to me with a package. We negotiated from there. We made the trade happen. You know, exactly. letting people know, hey, I'm willing to move these guys. You know, valuable players. Not just saying, hey, I'm looking to move like the bottom of my bench. Of course you are. You know, saying, hey, I'm looking to move these. I'm willing to move these guys in a package for these players in your team that you're probably willing to move. Finding that, you know, working together makes makes it happen. Last one here. Uh, for me, how do you avoid relying solely on rankings or expert opinions when making roster decisions? You know, rankings and expert opinions, quote unquote expert, you could say they only get you so far. You just have to remember that you're the guy setting your lineup every week, guy or gal. And you have to feel the league out. Every league is going to be different. You can't play the same game across 10 different leagues the same way. You just can't. Yep. You know, I understand that fantasy football is what it is, but every league, like I said, it's different. So you have to approach everything differently. Um, see what works for you. Don't just look at lists. Don't just look at rankings. That's not always going to work. You have to look, look at a player's past, look at a player's future, what your projected future is, see what they can be and see what they have done.